I'm the director and curator of the Van Avery Smith Galleries here at Davidson College. Welcome to our talk tonight with artists Bethany Collins and Dr. Hilary Green. Guys, I'm so happy to be here with you even virtually. Um, we are going to discuss a recent commission for the galleries and Davidson College tonight. With the support of the Justice, Equality, and Community Grant, we invited Bethany Collins to be the 2019-2020 Public Humanities Practitioner in Residence. And we asked her to engage with documents in Davidson's archive uh, related to the college's history with racism and slavery, and then to create a new work of art for our collection. The result, Dixie's Land, 1859 to 2001, just premiered in our current gallery exhibition. The gallery show is called From Pandemic to Protests, Visualizing Social Isolation and Social Injustices Through the Davidson College's Permanent Art Collection. So tonight we will hear about Bethany's process and we'll hear about this final commission. And then we will also hear from Dr. Hilary Green, about the history of the song Dixie that the artwork was based on, or Dixie's Land, and its relationship to the South, racism, slavery, and Southern colleges like Davidson College. Bethany Collins is a multidisciplinary artist who received her BA in studio art and visual journalism from the University of Alabama in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and her MFA in drawing and painting from Georgia State University in Atlanta. She has exhibited her work in prestigious institutions in both solo and group exhibitions, including at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Drawing Center in New York, the High Museum of Art in Atlanta. Can I say the Van Avery Smith Galleries That's at Davidson right. College as a prestigious institution? <laughs> Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Contemporary Art Museum in St. Louis, and the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, Massachusetts, among many other institutions. Bethany is a two-time recipient of the Artadia Art Award and has received a fellowship with the Illinois Arts Council. She has been selected for prestigious residencies, including at the Studio Museum in Harlem, Bemis Center for Contemporary Arts in Omaha, the McDowell Colony in Petersboro, New Hampshire, and the McCall Center um, here in Charlotte, North Carolina in 2018. As mentioned, we selected Bethany as the 2019-2020 um, Humanities practitioner in residence through the Justice, Equality, and Community Grant. And that resulted in the work of art that we'll talk about tonight. And Bethany is joining us from her studio in Chicago, where she is represented by Patron Gallery. Thank you. Dr. Hilary Green is an associate professor in the Department of Gender and Race Studies and serves as the co-program director of the African American Studies program at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. She also has a partial appointment in American Studies and for her sabbatical this academic year, we are lucky enough that she is teaching here at Davidson College in the position of the Van Professor of Ethics in Society. Dr. Green earned her BA in History with minors in Africana Studies and Pre-Healing Arts from Franklin and Marshall College, her MA in History from Tufts University, and a PhD in History from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research and teaching interests include the intersections of race, class, and gender in African American history, the American Civil War, Reconstruction, Civil War memory, the US South, 19th century America, and the Black Atlantic. Dr. Green is the author of Educational Reconstruction, African American Schools in the Urban South, 1865 to 1890, as well as many articles, book reviews, encyclopedia entries, and chapters in the Urban South During the Civil War Era, Epidemics and War, The Impact of Disease on Major Conflicts in History, and Reconciliation After Civil Wars, Global Perspectives. Her article entitled At Freedom's Margins, Race, Disability, Violence, and the Brewer Orphan Asylum in Southeastern North Carolina, 1865 to 1872, received the 2016 Lawrence Brewster Faculty Paper Award from the North Carolina Association of Historians. She's the book review editor for the Journal of North Carolina Association of Historians and the digital media editor responsible for Muster, the blog for the Journal of the Civil War Era. She is currently on, at work on two books, a book manuscript examining how everyday African-Americans remembered and commemorated the Civil War and 
and a documentary reader on the Confederate Memorial debates. She's also worked on several pieces exploring the enslaved experience at the University of Alabama. Welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I wanted to mention that um, Elizabeth Harry, our gallery and collection coordinator, is also joining us tonight, and she will be monitoring the chat in YouTube. So if you have questions, feel free to put your question in the chat, and we will address them as we can. So one of the reasons I wanted to bring both of you together is not just because of your relationship to the University of Alabama, um, but because Hillary as a historian and Bethany as an artist, you seem to have a common interest in language. Um, the things that I've read from Hillary or when I've heard you talk about um, Confederate monuments and statues, I'm here, I hear less about the visuals of those objects and more about the speeches and the songs around the dedications of the monuments and what those, what that language really tells us. And Bethany, you have said before that language is both your subject and your medium, and it's about the interrogation of language. And like Hillary, the relationship of language and race or maybe more specifically language and racism. So I thought we could start tonight by turning it over to Bethany. Um, Bethany, maybe you could talk a little bit about your practice kind of generally, which includes painting and drawing and printmaking, more recently artist books, and um, help us get a better understanding of how language is both subject and medium in your work. Yes, I would love to. Let me share my screen. It's really nice to be here with you all. Thank you for doing this. Does that look good? So language is, um, to put Dixie's land in context, I just wanted to show you um, my recent interest, my abiding interest is in language. It is the subject and primary material of my entire practice. I found it's a kind of prism through which to interrogate any other topic. If you can look at the archive for a particular time and a particular place, that there's not much you can't know about what, who we were in any given moment, sometimes even in the absence of what's present. So language is abidingly present in my practice, but chorus and song, language that kind of travels through the body has been a much more recent interest, probably since the 2016 election. So this is one of the first works that I made after the election, America, a hymnal. I am always dealing with the language of others to make sense of the world. Um, and America, a hymnal is based on a hundred contrafactum of my country, Tisipi. So contrafacta are songs that retain the same melody. The melody is constant, but the lyrics are rewritten over time and usually for different social political causes. My country, tis of thee, there exist at least 100 versions rewritten from the 18th to 20th centuries for different movements. So the labor union, labor movement has their versions, suffrage, prohibition, lots of temperance versions. You can tell what we are obsessed on at a given moment by how many versions, rewritten versions of the song exist, tons of prohibition. The Confederacy has their versions and as do the abolitionist and the union versions, right? So a hundred different ways of considering through this one patriotic song, what it means to be American. And for me, what's su super interesting in that idea is that what it means to be American, at least through these 100 versions is often in opposition to each other. So to bind them together means that they must forever abide one another, but it's not a peaceful coexistence, right? The lyrics remain legible but I burned the musical notation of the song away so that whatever was tying them together is now gone and just 100 differences remain. And the song also becomes in a way unsingable. It's kind of singed into memory and unsingable simultaneously. It's also interesting, and this is one of the, mm, is this one of the first works I think that was added to the collection at Davidson, yeah? Um, is that the more you turn the pages, because those tiny little notes have been burned away with a laser cutter, it's these tiny negative spaces, absent marks. And so they get tangled up together the more you flip through and read the hymnal. And so the more you participate in the reading of the text, democracy, the more it complicated it becomes, the more it kind of you aid in the destruction of the thing, it complicates itself. 
and becomes more and more, less and less legible and more and more unsingable. This is the newest hymnal in this series, uh, the Star Spangled Banner, similarly a contrafactum, a hundred versions exist. I bound the first hymnal in a um, shape note style. Shape note singers, mm, this was a much more common early American practice like contrafactum, like Weird Al Yankovic still does this, but it doesn't happen very often otherwise that you change the, <laughs> um, change the lyrics but keep the melody. Um, shape note singers or sacred harp singers began in the colonies, much more still popular in the American South today. It's thought to be a very egalitarian form of singing and learning music because the notes are actually shaped there. I mean, this is the early version, sorry, here. Um, they are circles and triangles and squares. There is no leader for shape note singing. You sit in a hollow square. People take turns choosing the song. Um, and you sing, you used to get together. I mean, they still do actually get together and just have these endurance singings, morning till night, right? Singing through these, all of these secular sacred songs. So this is a shape note style because I grew up in Alabama, actually in Montgomery um, and went to church with a lot of shape note singers. And so it's, it's, um, it has a particular resonance for me. This hymnal um, actually looks like the Presbyterian hymnal that I grew up with. And so I'm looking for ways to tie, um, to tie in a kind of belief in democracy, a belief in the secular thing. So there's one more hymnal coming, but this is the second in the version. And you can see how the work falls apart. The more that you turn the pages, the more that it's read. When the hymnals bound kind of um, close for a long period of time and then opened, that burn still wafts from the surface of the book. It's a very kind of visceral text. And to me, it feels like a way, it felt like a way to grapple with that post-2016 election moment. One of the first ways. These came next. So I just want to mention the few works that are in relationship to song. Um, these works are based on a book kind of, by Edie Hirsch. He wrote it in 87, 88. Uh, it's called Cultural Literacy, Things Every American Should Know. And if you know them, we will feel like we belong together. That's the proposition. In the back of the text, there's an index of 5,000 things that according to Hirsch, if we know them, we will have a shared sense of national identity. We will. It's this kind of calling into the future that if you know them, you will feel it. You just will, says Hirsch. Um, and in that list of 5,000 things, there's nine patriotic songs listed. And so I made a panel for each of the nine songs, beginning with My Country Tis of Thee. So this work starts the series. It's also matches, mimics the red of America, a hymnal, the first song. And it is also referencing My Country Tis of Thee. From each song, from each of the nine songs that are listed in Hirsch's index, each becomes a panel. And from each song, I'm picking a lyric that feels like it belongs in love song versus complicated, patriotic, national anthem kind of song. So from my country, tis of thee, I pulled thy name I love. And what you see as a uh, text across the background, written and then erased in that chalkboard lesson kind of way. And also what you see on top of those is tiny letters, uh, kind of these sprinklings of chalk dust is actually that, that lyric, thy name I love written over and over again. This process for me is a kind of obsessive meditation. Meditation feels nice and obsession doesn't, so I put them together. It's an obsessive meditation on a text until I feel like I understand the intent of it, but also what I might, I'm not a good first responder, so how I might respond to a problematic text after I've had time to think about it. Every work in the series after the My Country Tis of Thee panel becomes a deeper and darker red until they fall into complete shadow with amazing grace. This is America the Beautiful, and the lyric that's pulled is who more than self. The text also changes color, so I tend to think of these as white noise, it's like TV static. Black noise is a different frequency of sound that is actually pure silence or as close as we can get. So the song that cannot be sung and therefore cannot ever make us feel like we actually belong together in this place. This is a detail just so you can see some of that text obsessively rewritten over and over again. 
the limitation or the rule for these works was that I would write it until my hand hurt. And then I had to walk away from the text because otherwise you would write until oblivion. There is no end to obsession. You need some sort of um, imposed limitation for the pieces. This is You're a Grand Old Flag. And the lyric is, I am for you. What's also interesting is Hirsch had a couple of songs that um, didn't have love language in them. Um, over there, I think it's a World War II song. It's just a repetition of over there, over there, over there. It's not a lot of love language. So I uh, replaced a couple of songs um, for his. One was the Black National Anthem. And then I think the other one was actually Amazing Grace. So I consider that my collaboration with Hirsch. <laughs> The last pieces I wanted to mention um, series are actually not song based, but I think they're interesting in the way that they become a kind of chorus, uh, a spoken chorus over time. And also for the way that they draw past into, into the now in the same way that Dixie's Land I hope does. So these works, do you know them? This is, do you know them from 1898 are based on classified ads that were posted by formerly enslaved people. Um, from emancipation all the way up until the 1920s, looking for their loved ones. What's interesting and heartbreaking about the ads, um, so they were posted in about six different Afri African-American newspapers across the South and, and to the Northeast as well. Um, you would write everything that you could remember, a scar, where you lived, former owners' names, plantations, places, um, many, many names were given, right? Because it depended who you knew them as. There's this tricky way, I think tricky is positive here. There's this tricky way of which name you give um, to depending on who you're speaking to and who you want to be claimed by. And so lots of nicknames would be given or left out in case someone else was looking for you that you didn't want to find you. They're very interesting and they, they become these really like public private love letters looking for family. The chorus of them is that not everybody got the newspapers, not everybody could read at the time. And so a lot of times ministers would read the classified ads from the pulpit so that they could reach a broader audience. And I think people start to hear how others are asking and that becomes the refrain. So do you know them? You can see it at the top of the ad. Do you know them becomes a, re a reoccurring question. Have you seen her? Uh, will the ministers of the South please read this from your pulpits? That happens over and over again. Can you help me to find my people? Those become this really tragic chorus of the past to present. They're falling apart because I made these after the family separation crisis at the border. So I embossed them twice, um, which is a way to kind of uh, hint at the repetition of violence in American history, like a particular form of violence, of separating family as. Uh, punishment and torture, and also to kind of claim, um, you know, what's fascinating is that people keep, sometimes you find people who um, post every year. Um, sometimes they post every decade. They post until the 1920s. I mean, that's 40, 50, 60 odd years later, and you're still looking for your family, that those ties don't end. That becomes another kind of sorrowful refrain. Did I mention, I embossed them twice, repetition of the past, and they fall apart because the second time, the third time you keep doing a thing, um, the institution may not hold up each time. So the abrasions become reference to that. Leah, I think I'll stop there just to give us a sense um, of practice as a whole. That sounds good. Um, so we, I mentioned earlier that we showed your work in 2016 and um, shortly after that Davidson created a commission on race and slavery and um, you know as a way of sort of exploring our past and we as the galleries really wanted to commission a project work sort of analogous to the commission and think about the way that art could interrogate and highlight and engage with our past and Think about, um, can art help us move forward? It's a question I feel like I ask a lot, like, does art work? What does it do? Can it do something? Um, and so when we were thinking about this idea, Bethany, you came to mind because your practice is so research-based and because you often use an archive. Um, 
so we invited you to do this. We feel lucky that you said yes, um, and that the Justice, Equality, and Community Grant was able to fund it. But can you take us through the process a little bit? Um, I was hearing you talk about the songs and like looking for the language of love and the documents that we were asking you to look at and many of the documents you look at are painful and they're about trauma. And so what were you looking for? And how did you know, how do you know when you find it? Mm. Good <laughs> question. Um, you know, what I love about the archive, like dictionaries, I mean, dictionaries are their own little archive of like a decade of language, is that they represent this tantalizing proposition that uh, you could possibly know everything about a moment. If you, if you could read the whole archive, if you could read all of Davidson's archives, then you could know everything that led us to now. It's like an inherently flawed premise, but it's also a kind of lovely promise. But starting with an archive, especially an unfamiliar one, is like, it's like a blank sheet. I have blank sheets up on my wall right now that are um, what, teasing me, taunting me. <laughs> it's like looking at a blank sheet. You don't know what you're, you don't know where to start. So what was really nice was getting to work with the archivist at Davidson. Jessica Cottle was super helpful. Um, and a couple of student assistants as well, Cole and Cooper, just to get a sense of what's present there. But it didn't, what I wanted didn't take shape until I was actually on campus. And then I just, I mean, Hillary, you know this, I just got to sit in the archive and like be brought documents. It was like a vacation. I mean, it was like being on a cruise ship for artists. <laughs> Bring me the documents and you don't know what you're looking for. So I can say, Jessica, I need, this is like my topic. This is what I'm interested in. And then that repository that they hold, they're like really beautifully complex Google search engines that are like making connections between things I would never know. Um, that was very fun. Um, some of the early things I was interested in, I don't know if you asked me this, was the Arboretum status of Davidson. Yeah, so interesting. I think you got it in 1986, and I thought this would be what the project was, something in response to your Arboretum status, that you have a wide diversity of trees and your commitment to care for those trees has been really consistent until you got this national like worthy status. And it's so fancy, your 600 acre campus is worthy of being an Arboretum, it's really lovely. Um, but also that I found in the archive that there are legacy trees planted on campus, campus, teaching on campus, this is campus. Um, legacy trees, including those that were planted by people going off to war, to, to the Civil War. Woodrow Wilson planted a tree, you know, who knows which one that is. Um, and that your landscape can hold your history, that it, the landscape becomes a kind of archive too, super interesting. But also because I'm interested in floriography, just the language of flowers. And I got to meet with Annie Merrill, who showed me all her floriography books. All of which to say there were like lots of possible threaded possibilities where the project could go. And I left campus after our visit feeling that way. There was like three different possible ways. I found Dixie, references to Dixie in your archive. And I thought that's really interesting. I'll put it in my back pocket. I don't wanna touch it, it's too hot, right? I mean, part of the archive is figuring out what do you do with the irredeemable parts of it? <laughs> and the irredeemable parts of ourselves. And is it, is it worthy, and Dixie wasn't to me, to be replicated into the world? Um, and so I, I didn't want to touch it for a long time. So we eventually came back there. Am I talking too long? Do you want me to take a break? Oh. What do you? I'm okay. I can go in and explain probably please. why you want not touch it. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please do, because I had some, I didn't know what you were going to do when you left. I was like, she's looking at Bibles. She's looking at Dixie. She's looking at trees. The Odyssey came yeah. up in our, in our archive. But when you landed on Dixie, I was a little bit nervous. So maybe Hillary <laughs> could talk about it. Well, one of the things is too, is because the archives that were created, whether it's Davidson or other Southern institutions, was to preserve a nostalgic past, a past that did not exist. That doesn't really reflect the diversity of the day. And when I hear the song Dixie, and uh, especially on college campuses with these long histories and the silences in there, I'm reminded how 
not so much the song during when it was created, but the politicization almost immediately after Confederate defeat in um, Richmond, but also the long, there's several surrenders. Read David um, Silkenet's new book on surrender so you can see about mm -hmm. the last one that happens in the UK, <laughs> not on American soil at all. Um, but it becomes a language of love and nostalgia, but also violence to newly emancipated individuals. And at the same time, when African-American and other communities who are the subject of the violence for this nostalgia of a past of white men grounded in white supremacy, it means hate, domination, violence, and their lack of citizenship. And it's songs, mm -hmm. dueling songs that almost immediately are being used. So Dixie gets used right away in early race riots that follow. And in parades that African-Americans are celebrating emancipation, you always have a group of white youth who usually leads to some kind of fights singing Dixie Encounter, where African-Americans are singing John Brown's Body and mm -hmm. other regiment songs. You, so you have these competing choruses of language. Mm. And for these spaces and these languages and air and this competing landscape of what the war meant, what does emancipation mean and what to deal with the 4 million people, these were not simple questions, but they were bitterly contested. And we think about sometimes violence, we forget about the cultural violence and Dixie was a part of that landscape. Mm -hmm. and the singing of the songs in the spaces of those songs. So it's not ironic that these songs of Dixie as the early monuments to the Confederate soldiers start to appear in cemeteries and the decorating of graves, Dixie's being sung. And sometimes you in the cemeteries on the edges of community, oftentimes in black communities near schoolhouses, you might get some John Brown Party, I have a case in my book on Mobile where young kids start singing at the top of their lungs, John Brown Party, as white women in Mobile are putting grays and humming Dixie. <laughs> it's one of these things I find fascinating. But then college campuses embrace this landscape mm -hmm. and use of Dixie for various ways. And one of those ways is in its Greek life with Kappa Alpha or K.A., and their creation and with Robert E. Lee as their spiritual founder. So when they celebrate Lee Day in January, and then also to Old South Day shortly, usually in the spring and other events, oftentimes those early stu students would probably be wearing uniforms of the old Confederacy. Dixie became a way to say, this is a white only space because African-Americans cannot attend this campus and we are the rightful heirs of this new nation despite emancipation occurring. And I think that continuation of that becomes really crystallized when we see in the Davidson archives in my brief time here, I was struck not so much about how Dixie appeared early on in the yearbooks, but the role of blackface minstrelsy, the performance and the skewed ways in which Dixie got fed into humor on college campuses. And I kept on thinking about the African-Americans who are still employed at the universe, at the campus, but now are still under the same name that they were called under slavery, college servants. So what did they hear? Their legacy, some of them were formerly enslaved at the campus briefly, others in the community. What do they hear when they see these skits? or sometimes they're brought in as the props to humor of students and made fun of and poked just in the yearbooks. But then also to how Dixie gets used after this um, post-World War II, especially on college campuses, including the University of Alabama and other Southern schools because that becomes the rallying cry to resist desegregation. So at the University of Alabama, one of the things I find quite striking at a school that gets destroyed during the Civil War, April 4th, 1865. Dixie did not really come a game play until on the football fields until the, after World War II. And it's because they went to another SEC school and the Bama fans felt that the other school outperformed them by performing Dixie as part of their repertoire. And the band director talks about how they got a request 
by alum and by students because they were out Dixied <laughs> at the site of where Montgomery was, the first capital of the Confederacy, that they needed to start to play Dixie. And as the fights to lead to desegregation with the 1950s of Arthur E. Lucy Foster's desegregation attempt in 56, 63, and then when Black students are in, Dixie becomes this resistance to like the post-Civil War that we might have no more slavery, but African-Americans are still inferior. They still have to deal with our cultural landscape and through this song, we're gonna remind them of their place. So the height of Dixie and the Old South parades that get grander and bigger on college mm -hmm. campuses once there's desegregation continues. So you start seeing Dixie being politicized well up into the 21st century. And so campuses, some campuses have stopped playing Dixie, like the University of Mississippi. But on the University of Alabama, the brief respite from Dixieland Delight, <laughs> which yeah. is a more modern day phenomenon after the Ma Charleston Massacre, there was another petition to bring it back. And there's still fights over bringing it back. And I have sat in the stands, I go to every game, because mm -hmm. I have students on the field, so I support them. I've seen black fans start singing, lift every voice and sing and mm. counter to Dixie land and light, just the word Dixie that represents everything else. And I like that chorus and those competing choruses and what does this mean and how a nation and Bethany, your art, I keep on thinking about a nation that was only four years in Lent but the cultural remnants of it still last much longer. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you have the burnt nation still persistent, but also those choruses bleeding in that you can't tell where those voices come in, but what can be done and to have conversations of what this means and bring some harmony in different ways. I'm not sure if all of them come together, that there's nothing, mm -hmm. there's no meaning, but we can make new meaning. So for me, Dixie and that power of Dixie and the information wanted at. So I will end with this. My uh, doctoral advisor was Heather Williams. I helped her find some of the ads that I were used in the book. Help me to find my people. Yes. Just that chorus and think about the reading of those in the text of a church pulpit. So the spirituals linking slavery, present institutions and the like, but the singing and the various persons, but also that call and response. I can yeah. hear <laughs> the people as they're reading saying amen mm -hmm. and this calling out that there's still something lyrical in there. So how mm -hmm. can we bring both of those together in the complex way of America and at Southern colleges and universities? I, um, I, I thank you for sharing that and helping us kind of understand it. I think, I think Bethany, you had some of the documents in the archive, um, if you want to share your screen, but sure. it's interesting that I have learned through this project sort of that, that this song, there was a resurgence of the song the same way as the Confederate flag and other things around um, around desegregation and yeah it's interesting I grew up in the north I moved to the south and realized that MLK was being celebrated on the same day as Robert E. Lee and that was a very confusing thing <laughs> to me um, and so when we had started talking about the song I I, I don't have that that nostalgia because it wasn't part of my upbringing um, I, I sort of understood more of the terror side of it. And I think that's why I got so nervous when you started talking about the song and using this. Um, and I worried that we would be almost creating our own little Confederate monument. That what, what would it mean to display it on campus? What, I didn't know exactly what, what the object would be, but how would people experience it? What would be their, their response to seeing it? We know that people don't read labels, right? Like people don't read art labels. Um, so can you talk more about the actual, Bethany, talk more about the project, what it looks like, especially for folks that, that can't come to the gallery right now and see it. Um, and maybe talk a little bit about some of the aesthetic decisions that you made that sort of help move it from like a monument to um, to something that displays your stance on it. H how did you do that? You talked so 
beautifully earlier about like running the paper through twice and the sort of process and conceptual relationship of those of, of those kind of things. So mm -hmm. let me share my screen again. Sorry, that's a song. <laughs> um, so I think the first thing I saw in the archives for Dixie was this uh, letter from a reporter asking for information about when the last time the song was sung on campus, probably at a football game and why. He was writing, um, I don't think the book was ever published. I couldn't find it um, by this writer, but he was writing about lots, all Southern college campuses and when and why they ended the, the singing of Dixie. The letter on the right is the response from, um, I think one of the lead archivists who said he thinks uh, that it was ended in 1968 at the request um, of Coach Lefty uh, because he had black students on his team after Davidson was integrated in 62. And that was the reason why. It's probably, there's some, it seems like there's some accuracy to that in the archive. There's another letter where the coach requests or asks, I think, if he can do that, if he can just put an end to the singing of the song. And he's told by the administration that you, you, can't, you don't have the authority to do that. So later articles in Davidson mention his request, but not his like um, demand that it be ended. And they seemed, the volunteer pet band seemed to follow his lead. So there's quite a few articles in Davidson around this time and people's responses to that request that the song not be sung anymore at any athletic events and also that the Confederate flag be taken down at those events at the same time. And the protest that resulted, it angered quite a lot of students, probably faculty, administrative, I mean, just probably everybody. Um, petitions, letter writing campaigns, um, there's lots of Davidson, there's lots of Davidsonian articles about why people thought it was such a, you know the argument, it's just a song. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just tradition and heritage and that kind of argument and not an acknowledgement of what the song, how the song registers to other people's ears. So I grew up in Alabama, I think I mentioned in Montgomery and I remember hearing the song a lot. I went to the University of Alabama, I heard it a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if I heard it at football. I didn't go to a football game. So usually it would just be like uh, somebody riding down the street and you'd hear it. And it would make you, me, aware of my surroundings. Like, oh, if I hear the song, then it's just like an awareness that hits your body. It's like your teeth cringe and you want to know what time is it? Where am I? It's, yeah, it's a catchy, horrible song. Um, but what made it so interesting as a proposition for this project was that there's all this history of Davidson, like a lot of Southern college campuses with Dixie, Dixie's land. But there's also a professor who wrote a version. And so with my interest in contrafactum, that just felt like it's not gonna be the safest project. It's not gonna be the easiest project, but it's hard to not, it's hard to not grapple with that. Um, so Dr. Paul Berenger is a kind of affiliate faculty member, and he writes a wartime version, Dixie, World War I version of Dixie. 1917, I think it's copyrighted, and then he uses the money from sales, I don't know, to benefit the United Daughters of the Confederacy. So you have your own, I mean, your, your link to Dixie is a little bit stronger to me in that way, to have a version of these 100. So I thought they might be a hymnal and then we eventually um, disregarded that idea because to bind them back together in something sacred just felt um, wrong. So instead I pulled 10 versions of Dixie's Land that were written from 1859, the original version by Dan Emmett, the minstrel version, all the way up until 2001. Um, in between there are suffrage and labor union versions. And as Hillary mentioned, most of the versions alternate between Union and the Confederacy. Unlike My Country Tis a Bee and the Star Spangled Banner, it's like Dixie is just an argument between two armies and two ways of what it means to be American, two opposite versions of what it means to be American. You know, by the end of the Civil War, as Hillary also mentioned, um, 
the region and the South and that like history of racial terror was like inextricably linked to Dixie. Although there are equal, almost equal numbers of union versions of the song, it's like the Confederacy wins the song. It's always gonna be theirs. And so it always represents that, that racial terror of the well of past until now. The history of the South, which is the history of all of us. So I picked 10 versions and made a drawing for each of them. Let me show you up close. So I worked with a young composer, really wonderful composer, MJ Epperson, and he transposed the music of each of these versions. So the melody, which is fairly constant into a minor key. So it's in a major key as it's a traditionally sung, it's like jaunty and catchy. And he transposed each version into a minor key so that you can't, you can't sing it jauntily, right? It must be a mournful, sorrowful version of history and that feels more accurate. And then on top of each version, I created these charcoal drawings where I was looking at images of tear gas from 2020 protests, specifically after the murder of George Floyd, nationwide protest and these moments when um, tear gas was used on peaceful protesters. For me, and so each of them is a different, is a different um, image that I was looking at, a different protest. For me, I mean, the question was still why this was such a difficult work and took so long to make. That question was, what do you do with the irredeemable parts? Because you can't forget them. You run a risk if you just forget them and you stop talking about them. You can't replicate them and make another monument. And so the text couldn't just remain settled. It had to be disrupted. And that's what I'm hoping that the charcoal drawings do is to disrupt each time that song wants to be sung, is to remind of the actual violent past of this place. And also that it's a kind of haunting, right? The Dixie's not gone. 2020 didn't come out of nowhere. It's very much the, what that song represents is very much why we are in this moment now. It keeps haunting us. And I hope that's what the charcoal drawings on top are doing is disrupting is pointing to the violence of that song, of us collectively. Um, it's not allowing it to be sung or to be settled and to haunt. I hope it haunts. Did that answer your question, Leah? It does. Um, I wanted to ask you really quick about when you said it can't be sung because part of the other music related works, at least the hymnals you have orchestrated performances of America, a hymnal. Um, so I'm curious about that, like obviously because of the song and the racial terror, you don't want it to be sung. Um, but I'm curious about the singing of the other songs because there are some troubling things in, in the other versions of America. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are um, racist Confederate versions in, of My Country, Tis of Thee, and the Star Spangled Banner. There's plenty. Um, but they, they're put in context with like a hundred other versions, so they don't overwhelm. Because Dixie, like the Confederacy wins the song of Dixie, they it, it can have it. Um, it. The other versions don't put it into context. They don't overwhelm it. Mm. They won't. So I can't imagine a performance uh, where that's put, put back into the world. But I will say the last version, the last drawing in the series is by Renee Marie, she's a black jazz singer, um, who sings this beautiful version of Dixie. It starts with the first stanza of Dixie, and then it morphs into Abel Maripol's anti-lynching poem, Strange Fruit. And it's like, that's, that's America. That feels like an accurate story. But she does it really well. I don't need to do a performance of it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that because we had not talked about the the way that the piece ends. And I think removing it from the book form, we now can see all 10 versions at once, which yep. feels better in some way for this work that you end on this other version. Whereas with the hymnal, often when they are displayed in a museum or gallery, it's open to whatever page the staff chooses and there's you know you're not able to flip through and see those other versions so thank you for remembering to to mention that part of the the project um 
So although we have focused a lot on Dixie, Hillary, because we have you here and you are <laughs> working on Confederate monuments, I, I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about that. And I think we can tie it into one of Bethany's comments about, um, you know, do you remove, when she was talking about sort of other people thinking about if you remove things or not, um, and whether or not that sort of erases history, that kind of argument. But um, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about, um, more about the way that white people and white Southerners really got to shape public spaces. And you had touched on it earlier about um, the monuments start in cemeteries, but they move into other spaces, into more public spaces. Yeah, and they move into public spaces at the same time post-1876 election where Southern, uh, there's a national movement that the South can deal with its own problems, government will not interfere. And this is where you see the height of lynching, the height of disenfranchisement, every banishment, people being pushed out of public spaces and this racialized terror. And, oh, hold on. Okay, and I had unstable connection there. Um, and so for me, these monuments come up at the same time of African-American removal from public lands. And it's an undemocratic process because it's white only spaces that kicked out the few opposition. And if people protested, they were killed. There, is no, there, there was no democracy anymore. So the song and singing of that song becomes a way with the monuments to mark new geographies, new realities, as if the Confederacy won. And so for me, the, the Davidsonian remarks about um, why should we start singing it, it also reflects, I think, where we are today with as a nation. We never reconcile slavery. We never reconcile what Dixie meant, a creation of a country that was designed but broke away from the United States and fought against the United States over a nation grounded in slavery and white supremacy. And as a result, when you have these landscape spaces and people can't, their geography moves around it, it's hard to unearth something that some people had the choice to ignore. It was tradition, it was fun, but for others, it was pain. And so with the monument removal, I also say for this, it's not, they're not even monuments that are accurate. They're monuments placed up at a very political moment, 30 to 40 years, and sometimes more after the Civil War. And a lot of monuments, um, including one at the University of Alabama that was removed on June 9th, 2020, <laughs> the protest to remove that is decades long. It started when there are black students meaningfully on campus. And the values of diversity, equity, inclusion start getting into play, but it takes a while to enlarge those uh, memories. And on that boulder that was removed, the one group of people that were lost in all of that and on all of the Confederate monuments were the enslaved people who were forced to work for the nation, who forced to work on these college campuses. The university impressed enslaved people. They hired out enslaved people. They still owned enslaved people. None of them were on that marker. And at the dedication of that monument, there were several, a couple former enslaved people still working for the university, but now as paid employees. They are facilities workers who had to watch Dixie and the Reverend Yell get performed, <laughs> and then they had to clean it up. So it's this, re these monuments erased slavery, it erased um, dissent to the Confederacy that was even Southerner, and also erases the fact that African Americans are Southerners too. And for them, they had no investment in Dixie <laughs> and the Confederacy. So these are false memories, nostalgic memories. And so monuments don't teach, people do. Art can be an entry point to have these difficult conversations. People in other means can be to counter, but we're not a race in history. And in fact, the one at UA and other places, they're just going to storage like other monuments do <laughs> all the time <laughs> and not being on display. But we're no longer in public place to remind people, uh, especially marginalized communities, that they do not belong. Their value, even though they pay taxes, don't belong. And it causes trauma. So the question I have with these communities as they've been coming down is people find the side that the trauma of a few matters in the 
holistic health of all? And how can we have these difficult conversations to question for some, those who had the privilege to ignore and hear those voices and pains that were always there. And so for me, it's a pivotal moment and over 110 monuments, plaques, busts, and prominent statues and buildings that I call in other ways, uh, monuments themselves have come down since the end of May. So George Floyd is a major reckoning. And now I wanna know is what kind of art can we put in place? So Bethany, I'm thinking about your thing. What can fill the void of these empty pedestals? And how can we use the arts and having art on the wall, the other places to do this healing? Good questions. <laughs> <laughs> so can you talk about, just to mention for folks, and maybe we can put it in the um, chat on YouTube, your mapping project. Mm -hmm. That number, you know that number is true because you've been <laughs> tracking this. Yeah, so um, I have on two places, uh, my uh, I have a UA website, which is this my name, HN Green number one um, um, at ua.edu and that has the monument removal one but I also have an individual personal website which is hngreen.com and then on there on the public um, projects you'll see the monument removal link in there and I will be updating tomorrow so I just added another three that's why I know how many <laughs> have come down and that doesn't include the Columbuses and everything else that's its own category mm. but this is a major moment and I think arts and artists have a way to speak and, and I keep on thinking about the British um, monument of Edward Coulson. It was a black woman bare chested like this is what we're going to put a temporary piece of arts to bring healing rather than trauma for generations of um, British uh, people who had to walk by that. It's been really interesting to kind of follow the removals and to see what is put in place because I've been of the mind that we should not replace one person with another person. Um, and so I feel like the, the thing to do is really to look to artists to help us figure out what to do next. I think artists can come up with more creative ways of um, representing our values rather than specific individuals. I think we can think a little more abstractly maybe. Um, I don't know. So, um, so it was good. To, it's good to hear the numbers that you gave because in my head, you know, I think we all think that monuments are coming down in bigger numbers. But I do remember that after the murders at the Emanuel African Church in Charleston, that's when North Carolina sort of tightened their hold. Um, and on, on monuments, right? Laws yeah. were actually enacted. So it, it does feel like this is really a pivotal moment and that things will change. Um, it, it feels a little more optimistic to me. Well, yeah. I could say this, Alabama too tightened up its laws, but mm. there's $25,000 is the going rate for removals that has not stopped eight communities to take down their monuments. But the other thing is though, um, the push against them has continued, but it didn't take, it took more than 10 people to die. And I count the people at Charleston, Heather Heyer, but it was this summer, COVID. All, everything that was done post that North Carolina and Virginia are, have been leading the way. Texas is following and it's municipalities deciding maybe we should do something with these. So you usually track North Carolina by a vote it comes up to discussion, there's a vote, 30 days, it's in, It's removed in the middle of the night <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> type of thing and goes into storage. <laughs> but my favorite has been in Houston, one of the monuments has been purchased and it will be on display at the African-American History Museum in Houston. So it's mm -hmm. gonna be told by the black perspective of what it meant to go by this monument every day and properly contextualize. So I think art and museums have a way to go to do this work. I would agree. Bethany, do you have any um, sort of comments on that too? I, I sort of asked that question earlier of like what art can do. Um, so what can this yeah. art do? I mean, we do envision this piece to leave the gallery after the show closes October 18th and move it into a more public space. And obviously we will provide contextualization, but 
Yeah. What can it do? <laughs> <laughs> what will it do? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, when it's out of the studio, it becomes its own, it becomes its own entity. Um, but I was reading, um, I started Isabel Wilkerson's book, Cast, and she talks about, I mean, just an introduction, such a lovely writer, about America as an old house and that we are the heirs of a really old house. And this house is really pretty from the porch, but the basement is flooding because we haven't been paying attention. Um, and that, you know, like consequences of not paying attention to cracks in your foundation, it may be a year, it may be centuries later, the consequences come due. And that feels like this year, it's like a lot of consequences coming due, which is painful for um, most of us. I hope that the work, I hope that, I mean, I made the work in this year. It feels very much like a response to this terrible year. And I hope that the work does a little bit of what um, Wilkerson is pointing to, which is like, you have to notice. If you notice, if you don't notice, it is to your peril, right? We're all gonna suffer for it. So I hope it makes a connection between past and present, um, even if it's really difficult to look at. Yeah. That seems like a great way to end. And it is not difficult to look at. I think well, the way that you have made it yeah. makes it accessible and draws you in, you know, obscuring some of the text, it, it requires you to get closer and look closely. And I think that is what we need to do. We need to examine ourselves and our past. So thank you for making this for us <laughs> and working with us on this project. It was a pleasure, a difficult pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. I think that, uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging. There was a moment there where we just kept saying that it felt hot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, untouchable. Yeah. untouchable. But it came to be. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I mean, I think a silver lining of COVID was actually, we did have more time to think through it. Yeah. And I love that it, you utilize the current moment to like really bring the work right into this moment using the tear gas imagery. So thank you for all of your thoughtful consideration. Um, do, you, do you all have any questions for each other or anything else to add? No girl, I'm about to go read all your work. <laughs> <laughs> all of it. I just think it's a beautiful piece. When I saw it, mm -hmm. I was moved. And the because I studied this and I think about the ways music and songs and it was striking and just the you had to look and when you said lower in the key I kept on thinking of old spirituals yeah and mm -hmm. a different type of register in there and I really enjoyed it so for me as to see it I am grateful that you created this Thank and especially you. as the university at uh, the Davidson's deal on fits past now this is so relevant Thank to you, its Hillary. future it looks like there is a question mm -hmm. For you all. Okay. Yeah, this is a question for Bethany from Tim. He says, thank you for having the terrific conversation today. I'm curious to hear about silence. In your work, Bethany, you have made a lot of work that removes a lot of visual language through the reading or drawing processes. Can you talk about how you use silence, visual or otherwise, as a way of giving voice? Can you speak to institutional silence? versus defiant silencing? Um, Tim is very perceptive. This silence is something that I don't know how to grapple with yet, but it feels like it's present. It's present in an un, a lot of my work is very controlled. I feel like I, I know by the time I start the work, I know how I want to make the work, but the silent part of it, I don't know what I'm doing there yet. There were several um, drawings of Dixie that I made that didn't have any language in them. And it felt like there's something interesting there. So there were no lyrics. It was just the song and then the charcoal on top. And I think it was, I think it was pointing to the kind of ingrained nature of the song that just that melt, you know, you hear it, like what, you can hear a jingle and you know exactly what it's referencing, even without the words, that it has that, the song has that quality to it. And also the refusal to give the lyrics. There's something interesting there. 
But usually what I think is silence in the work is actually a kind of transferal of frustration onto the viewer. It's like the language is problem for me and it's frustrating. And whether it's um, embossing so that the work is really difficult and painful on your eyes to read or writing over and over again until it becomes illegible or blocking it out or erasing it with spit. All these processes are about transferring what is frustrating for me back to you so that you have to deal with it um, and I can be done with it, right? So I think silence and frustration have some sort of um, relationship there, right? Very interesting. If there are not other questions, we may have ended right on time. <laughs> A miracle. Yeah, thank you both so much for, for joining me tonight. And um, thank you for the work. And Hillary, we are so excited to have you here on campus too. So I look forward to more uh, socially distanced yeah. <laughs> <good> things. <laughs> I think that's my mantra for this whole year, socially distanced. But I will be back to see the, um, the, the exhibit this week, that's my goal. If not this week, next week for sure. Please do, and students that are watching, the galleries are open for you. It is one of the things you can do on campus safely. Um, the galleries are open seven days a week, 10 to five on weekdays and um, 12 to four on weekends. So we hope that we will see you in the galleries to see this work. There's also um, one of Bethany's hymnals, America a Hymnal is on view as well. And we did just purchase the Star Spangled Banner. It is not in the exhibition, but it is available in our collection for students to study and see. So we look forward to welcoming you to the collection. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary and Leah. Thank you. Thank you.